Yeah, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Steve, for this uh, introduction. And I can only uh, merge you uh, in uh, thanking the organizers for bringing me here, uh, for inviting me actually to this beautiful place and uh, for putting up uh, such a great program, uh, uh, exposing us to the culture of India in many, many ways. And uh, I enjoyed it very much, actually, uh, 15 years after my first time to India, where it was in Kolkata. And now I have to, uh, the pleasure and the privilege, actually, to en enjoy this, this place here and meeting so many colleagues of you. Um, so is that sufficiently well working? This uh, Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, going to talk about today uh, about a, a method, a new method, so to say, with the use of synchronous radiation and nuclear resonant scattering. Um, <clears throat> that means Merzbauer spectroscopy with synchronous radiation um, <clears throat> to determine hyperfine interactions. Uh, before I start, I want to introduce myself a little bit more. I'm from DAISY in Hamburg, which is a German national research center, basically for, for mostly for synchronous radiation research right now. Uh, but the accelerators at DAISY that have been built for high energy physics, they're mostly now used for generating X-rays, highly brilliant X-rays. And here you see an aerial view of our campus. Uh, so uh, in the background you see the Elbe River, but here uh, most prominently the DAISY campus with this big hall here. This is the experimental hall of the synchrotron radiation facility Petra 3, where many of you, or some of you, have been there already uh, having beam time for experiments uh, and uh, okay you see you can imagine here this is this ring structure here and there's this uh, experimental hall where also I did my experiment we did our experiments that I'm going to talk about today um, so this is a short overview of how the uh, accelerators look like in a floor plan so to say I don't want to go into many details here but the most prominent addition it's not a ring-like accelerator, it's a linear accelerator, the European X-ray free electron laser that has been uh, <coughs> put into operation at the end of 2017, now already in user mode. And we are also looking forward to first nuclear resonance scattering experiments uh, at this machine. Um, <coughs> okay, so the outline. Um, motivation. Why I'm going to talk about Purity, high purity polarimetry today. Uh, the motivation is to study, the deeper motivation is to study anisotropies and condensed matter. Anisotropies, actually, uh, this, word's, this word sounds quite technical, but anisotropies are very important for our everyday life. A completely isotropic world would be completely boring, right? So we need broken symmetries. We need broken symmetries to, uh, to be able to live. Uh, <coughs> Broken symmetries uh, that lead to phenomena uh, like magnetism, for example. This is uh, just one example our, out of our field of work. Uh, <coughs> but wherever there yeah, is, uh, say, uh, there's an interface, there's a broken translational symmetry, for example. Um, and uh, deeper into our field, actually, uh, in condensed matter physics, broken symmetries are responsible for phenomena uh, also like uh, superconductivity, uh, to name a very recent one for all kinds of correlated phenomena in condensed matter. And uh, to, uh, to get down to the origin of these phenomena, we need to study anisotropies. And this with uh, as, as high as uh, resolution and accuracy as possible. So we would like to follow the early stages of emergence of these anisotropies if you change, for example, temperature or any other external parameter. And uh, for that, we need a very sensitive method, and this is my suggestion today, uh, it's high purity polarimetry and I want to show you a little bit, give you a little bit of flavor of how this works. So uh, I will, in, in my second uh, section, focus on polarization properties of nuclear resonance scattering uh, and then uh, explain the method of high purity polarimetry for hard X-rays and uh, two applications actually, uh, magnetic structure of thin films and multilayers is one example. I want to uh, scratch just briefly out to uh, <coughs> uh, temporal reasons here and focus mostly on electric field gradients and metal organic compounds. So yeah, let me start uh, with uh, nuclear resonance scattering of synchronous radiation. Many of the speakers here in this conference talked about it uh, already or 
uh, introduced this uh, already. I will briefly go over it here again and uh, uh, show you this little animation. So this is the well-known hyperfine splitting of iron-57 in a ferromagnetic environment uh, with these six uh, <coughs> uh, hyperfine transition, magnetic dipole transitions. Uh, these parameters are also certainly well-known in this community. And I have a sample here with some iron-57 um, <coughs> nuclei in there in some kind of matrix. And what, what do we do when we do immersed power spectroscopy with synchronon radiation? Uh, we actually shine a pulsed broadband uh, <coughs> radiation uh, uh, <coughs> to excite all these um, all these transitions at the same time, simultaneously. So we actually uh, we hit six slightly detuned tuning forks at the very same time. So you, you can all you all know what happens if we excite two slightly detuned tuning forks. We know this from early physics classes, right? I mean, you hear a beating pattern, a beating pattern in time uh, <coughs> when these tuning forks are sort of radiating. Um, so here we have six uh, <coughs> levels, and I illustrate this here uh, with the pulse coming from the left. I repeat this here, a very short pulse, shorter than the lifetime, uh, exciting these uh, nuclei at the same time, so to say, um, and I have uh, picked out three of these uh, transition frequencies here uh, that are then radiated after the excitation and they are actually uh, superposed on top of each other and here on in this uh, kind of illustration you see a Moray pattern that gives you the beating frequency and that gets increasingly complex if you uh, superpose more and more frequencies on top of each other and eventually this looks like this here uh, where we have a, a beating pattern that reflects the energy level splitting and also the transition amplitudes, different transition amplitudes of these uh, levels here, so that you finally can take this beat pattern as a fingerprint, as a true fingerprint of the magnetic structure of the sample. Uh, I talk first about the magnetic structure, I will come to the electric hyperfine interaction later. And um, so this is um, yeah, another animation showing this principle, uh, how actually uh, does this fingerprint sort of uh, depend on the relative orientation of the magnetic moments in your sample relative to the photon wave vector. So we have here a thin film uh, illuminated in grazing incident geometry, that's the typical scattering geometry, uh, a thin film, um, and we have a moment uh, <coughs> that rotates, maybe guided by some external field that rotates around the sample, and uh, we have a cycle of um, different orientations relative to the photon wave vector and the corresponding beat pattern. So you have, uh, say, characteristic changes here that you can then use to determine the magnetic orientation of the moments in your sample. And uh, in combination with isotopic probe layers that you put in, selectively deposit into your thin film structure, you can really investigate the depth dependence of magnetic properties with very high spatial resolution. And uh, this is the following example here um, that we uh, an experiment that's been conducted already many years ago uh, where we uh, were actually interested in the magnetic structure of exchange spring magnetic heterostructures. So exchange spring means that you have a hard magnet, and this was mentioned a few times here on this conference, uh, a hard magnet like iron platinum with a soft magnet coated on top of it and the exchange interaction of the magnetic exchange interactions at the interface pins the moments here uh, at the very interface uh, <coughs> quite rigidly, and this interaction decreases with increasing distance from this, um, uh, from this interface so uh, that the moments here on top of the soft magnetic layer are, can be rotated rather easily. So if you apply an external field, you, ex uh, you create a fan, you create a fan-like spin structure, and we were interested in this very, uh, in the, in the depth dependent of the moment deviation, so to say, induced by an external field. And there, for that purpose, we deposited a tilted probe layer here into that system here um, uh, so that we can, uh, <coughs> that we were able, by transverse displacement, selecting the transverse displacement relative to the incident beam, we could select uh, to probe a specific depth uh, <coughs> from which the magnetic signal here, the uh, beat pattern or the, uh, uh, yeah, the time spectrum was generated from. 
uh, because determine it with very high spatial resolution, with very high lateral spatial resolution, uh, <coughs> so that we have a mapping, so to say, of this transverse displacement to the depth. And this uh, set of arrows here is the experimental result uh, for this specific geometry uh, uh, for an external field of 160 millitesla. That this is fan-like uh, spin structure um, that we could derive from this measure from these measurements. So here you see the data. The red lines are uh, the fits to the data that uh, matches quite well. Um, okay, so uh, that is the principle of the the, the application of the the method. Uh, <laughs> mean, meanwhile, this has been applied to many other Merzbauer isotopes. Uh, many of them are listed here. Uh, so we have a synchrotron, a very schematic view of a synchrotron with pulsed, with electron bunches circulating, giving rise to pulses of, say, 50 to 100 picosecond uh, long or short, I should say, separated by 200 nanoseconds. This matches very well the uh, temporal characteristics of the uh, IM57. Uh, Merzbauer isotope and so yeah this is again this level scheme so as soon as, as we put a sample here uh, we have a delayed response this fingerprint weed pattern so to say that is uh, actually then can be used in many many fields not only magnetism but also nanoscience geophysics biophysics wherever you have Merzbauer isotopes as spectators for the hyperfine detections for the electronic whatever magnetic structure in your sample I had the Pleasure, pleasure to write up this uh, <coughs> in this uh, book, um, <coughs> where you uh, find many uh, applications that are, meanwhile, already I have to say, outdated uh, quite, uh, uh, to some degree because this field has has grown and developed so so well over the past uh, 14 years uh, since this book was published that uh, I, I would have to rewrite this, this uh, again uh, to include all these new examples. Um, Okay, so this is an, another view on, on the uh, set of Merzbauer isotopes. Uh, so the blue um, dots here are those uh, isotopes that have been used um, in excitation with synchrotron radiation. Here's the level which uh, plotted against the transition energy and the, the size of the dots is uh, proportional to the resonant absorption cross-section. I, I put this up here to introduce you a new member in this family, which is actually uh, uh, blinking here that is a high energy transition uh, of 193 iridium um, at 73.4 uh, keV that we just recently uh, published or got accepted. Uh, it will come out soon. Uh, so this uh, iridium isotope, it's not the one that Merzbauer originally used. It was iridium 191, uh, but this one has a little lower transition energy and we uh, managed and we succeeded to study, for example, properties of correlated materials like the iridates, uh, <coughs> where uh, this is a quite uh, interesting probe actually to in investigate uh, correlated uh, uh, the properties of these correlated materials. Um, okay, so uh, I want to discuss polarization dependence and here is a, uh, mm, I go a little bit deeper into the, uh, the physics of this level uh, scheme here. So we have uh, of course, the, all these uh, transitions are polarized because they uh, proceed between um, different um, <coughs> uh, sublevels here of this magnetically split uh, ground and excited states with the corresponding energy dependence here uh, uh, related to these delta M um <coughs> uh, patterns. And um, uh, for each of these uh, oscillators, these transition uh, uh, amplitude um <coughs> uh, probabilities, you have uh, these uh, characteristic uh, emission patterns. So uh, for the delta M equals zero and the delta M plus minus one transitions, uh, I don't want to discuss them in detail here. I just want to give you a flavor of that. There is a really pronounced polarization dependence uh, in this uh, coordinate frame that I've selected here with the linear polarizations pi and sigma. And then you can uh, actually calculate the scattering amplitude actually that determines the optical properties of your material um, <coughs> uh, with, by, uh, by this uh, relatively complicated formula. But okay, if you look and look closer, you find actually contributions that are that have no polarization dependence. They are isotropic. Uh, they describe isotropic scattering. Uh, these are the polarization vectors of your polarization basis here, and this is the uh, moment orientation. Uh, 
you have uh, isotropy, you have circular anisotropy. So because these uh, uh, delta m equals plus minus one transitions are left or right circularly polarized. Uh, but you also have linear anisotropy that actually is introduced by the delta m equals zero uh, transitions. So these make up uh, actually uh, uh, the scattering amplitude and we will have a closer look actually you can uh, in a more compact fashion you can write them as a matrix as a two by two matrix that enters here into the index of refraction. So the index of refraction is of course the key to describe optical properties. Uh, if you want to calculate, for example, refractivities of thin film systems, uh, as we uh, will do, uh, <coughs> I show you later, uh, and uh, then actually you have these these green uh, contributions here, are all these functions that describe the energy dependence, and the red ones here are describing uh, the polarization dependence uh, <coughs> that is illustrated here. So ge geometry factors and energy uh, contributions are uh, merged here into this matrix from which you can construct the uh, index of refraction matrix for any magnetization geometry. Um, and this uh, leads to this uh, sort of lookup table, uh, if you like, uh, for I've plotted this here for selected geometries uh, as uh, emerging here from evaluation of, of this uh, 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 scattering amplitude. So uh, there's a, a certain Scattering geometry I've plotted here on the left uh, column uh, resulting in these uh, matrices and uh, resulting eventually then in, in these uh, fingerprint bead patterns, so to say. And uh, I want to direct your attention actually to this first geometry because this is the, the matrix, um, the only matrix that has non-diagonal elements, uh, <coughs> non-zero non diagonal, um, uh, that has non-zero off-diagonal elements, I should say. So here uh, you see these um, uh, <coughs> contributions that arise actually from the optical activity that is induced by circular dichroism. So if you come in with a linear polarized beam, as we typically do with uh, use of circular radiation, um, if you come with a linear polarized beam and you have uh, a uh, sample that is magnetized along the photon wave vector, um, these circular polarizations are the eigenpolarizations. But you come in with linear polarized light, which are not eigenpolarizations of that system. So uh, you get, uh, cross, polar, uh, you get uh, cross terms from sigma to pi and pi to sigma uh, <coughs> that account for this non-matching, so to say, of the incident to the eigenpolarizations of the system. And this gives rise to these non-zero off-diagonal elements. Uh, here, all the other geometries, uh, they have zero, they have no optical activity, uh, but this is a very important geometry here. As, long as, as soon as you have uh, uncompensated magnetic moments parallel to the photon wave vector, you will Im immediately have optical activity. Uh, this applies also, as I could have shown here, uh, there's also linear anisotropy, and I will illustrate this later. Uh, if you have uncompensated magnetic moments perpendicular Perpendicular to K0, you can also have optical activity. And I have actually left out here a geometry uh, that would uh, generate uh, this uh, <coughs> uh, behavior. But this uh, becomes more important uh, now if I talk about um, electric hyperfine interactions. So this is uh, the directional uh, uh, dependence in case of magnetic hyperfine interactions. Now we move over to electric hyperfine interactions. And there we have uh, uh, essentially the same. Um, functional dependence, except that the, uh, in this expression, the magnetic uh, unit, the moment, um, the unit vector of the magnetic moment of magnetic hyperfine field at the nucleus is uh, replaced by uh, uh, the unit vector along uh, uh, VZZ, the uh, principal direction of the electric field gradient tensor. So you see that's this replacement here, if you compare both expressions here, the M is replaced by VZZ. And uh, you evaluate the same expression here, uh, in, the, in the same, uh, this expression in the same fashion, arriving here at this uh, uh, sort of uh, panel, where we have similar, yeah, basically the same graphs here. Um, <laughs> and um, we actually get uh, off diagonal elements here for this geometry, where the uh, field gradient the VZZ direction points 45 degrees tilted relative uh, in a plane 
um, perpendicular to the photon wave vector. And this is a geometry that uh, uh, I, I hope it will resonate with you uh, in a slide that I show later, uh, that this uh, is actually leading to pronounced optical activity. And this forms the basis for the method, uh, for, for the applications I'm going to talk about later. Um, so we have here the, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, energy dependence resulting from the hyperfine splitting uh, in, uh, <coughs> uh, in the case of quadrupole interaction at the IM57 nucleus. So we have, uh, uh, if we look closer, of course, we have no circular anisotropy, so there's no reason why we should have circular uh, anisotropy because the F plus and F minus contributions uh, are equal and they cancel each other here. But we have, of course, a pronounced linear dichroism and, uh, <coughs> or linear anisotropy uh, that uh, will, I will discuss a few slides later. So uh, uh, this section of my talk should have illustrated you how optical activity can be introduced by electric and magnetic hyperfine interactions. And if we want to measure this, we need to measure the off-diagonal elements in the scattering amplitude matrix. How do we do this? The answer is we use polarization analysis. We need to analyze the polarization of the outgoing beam. And uh, this is actually a very simple uh, sketch here that most of you, maybe all of you know from uh, undergraduate physics or even from school. Uh, if you have, uh, say, two crossed polarizers, linear polarizers that are crossed by 90 degrees, you are used to, to see, uh, actually, you can block the radiation if you shine radiation into that system. The screen afterwards, it's dark because you really, you cross the polarizers and you, you cancel transmission through the system uh, and you get a dark screen. There's no transmission depending on how good your polarizers are. Um, but you can actually, uh, <coughs> Uh, play a trick and get some light through if you put an optically active material between, in between these cross polarizers. And what does this material do? Actually, this uh, 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 <coughs> introduces uh, sigma 2 pi scattering, so it uh, creates a polarization component that can be transmitted by the uh, subsequent vertical polarizer here. And afterwards, you get a brighter screen uh, depending on the degree of optical activity here in between. So this is well known from optical physics, uh, from <coughs> physics with visible light, you can get easily uh, these linear polarizers like Polaroid sheets or so and, uh, <coughs> and, and uh, 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 do this experiment. But you can also transfer this concept into the regime of hard X-rays. That is now the key of uh, following uh, uh, <coughs> what I'm uh, going to explain in the following. So uh, and this allows you actually to study charge and orbital anisotropies uh, that are actually leading to this optical activity. And the better you can discriminate this uh, pi component over the sigma component here, the more sensitive you are to anisotropies introduced by this uh, uh, sample here in between. Um, so we can do this. Uh, there is technology available to set up linear polarizers for hard X-rays. These are uh, reflections, um, Bragg reflections with a Bragg angle of 45 degree. So if you uh, do the calculations, if you, uh, if you look at into the detail of the, the physics of X-ray scattering, you will find that, um, of course, the index of refraction for X-rays is very close to one. Yeah? So that means that the Brewster angle is practically identical to 45 degrees. The Brewster angle that polarizes, that completely polarizes uh, a, a reflected beam. So we can set up Bragg reflections from silicon crystals with this Bragg angle here. It's not exactly 45 degrees, it's 45.1 degrees here, uh, the 840 reflection in silicon. But this gives uh, actually a very high discrimination of linear polarization. So you can set up cross polarizers with the suppression ratio of in the orders of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, or even, even further. So you can would have a, a very high purity of your uh, linear polarized beam after reflection by such a a, a, by, by a set of two crystals. These are two crystals actually for practical reasons. You want to make your beam parallel to the incident uh, beam. You don't want to get it all the way off to the ceiling uh, because you want to work with the beam after this reflection. Um, <coughs> that's why there are, there are two, two reflections here. And this is a set of polarizing reflections that uh, leads to this high purity uh, discrimination. So uh, I'm now at my first example, applications in magnetism. So this uh, system we have already 
seen to some degree here on the conference. So this is a coupled, uh, uh, an undeterminately coupled multilayer where uh, iron layers are coupled by chromium spacer layers um, uh, in an antiferromagnetically aligned uh, magnetization geometry, uh, ma magnetic order. They are coupled to a iron platinum hard magnetic uh, layer so that the uh, system is here aligned by a change interaction here at the very interface and we have a soft magnetic layer iron, an iron layer that also makes a change coupling to this multilayer on top. So with this we can actually uh, then use an external field to uh, actually um, uh, get an interaction with the antiferromagnetically coupled system here. So this, due to the exchange pinning here, we actually have uh, a means to, to twist, so to say, uh, this antiferromagnetically aligned multilayer in the same fashion as I have shown you in the previous example. So we can really make a fan-like um, <coughs> spin structure in this system, it resembles to some degree this uh, system I have shown before, but this is now a ternary magnetic heterostructure consisting of a soft ferromagnet, an antiferromagnet, uh, an artificial antiferromagnet, and a hard magnetic material. And we were interested actually in the spin structure that develops in external fields for these systems. So, and I can only briefly show you some of the results. So, there is, of course, a difference uh, if you detect the nuclear time specter without cross polarizers or with cross polarizers. That is shown here. So we analyzed many, many of these data. That was the doctoral thesis of Tatiana Goreva in my group. And here you see actually a, a selected set of these time spectra detected with polarization analysis from which we could really nicely deduce together with the data taken without polarizers, I have to say, uh, by selecting of this uh, scattering channel, we had uh, even more data that we can, from which we could reliably, relatively reliably, in a, in a fast converging scheme, we could deduce the spin structure of these uh, uh, multilayers. And um, this is an example how, how you use this technique for an analysis of, um, <coughs> of magnetic heterostructures. But I want to move on and um, uh, come back to the polarization properties of the electric hyperfine interaction. And uh, this is uh, basically what I have shown already. I work out the, the scattering matrix here in a little bit in more detail, uh, writing it down explicitly here. So, uh, and concentrating here on a geometry where actually the, the principal component of the magnetic, uh, the electric field gradient tensor is, uh, is lying in the plane perpendicular to the perpendicular to the incident photon wave vector. This is a photon wave vector. So we have, say, uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> arrangement where we uh, rotate actually the sample in a way uh, that this vector here uh, 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 is characterized by uh, an angle phi relative, for example, to this, um, um, uh, the, pi wave, uh, the pi vector of the polarization basis. And this gives rise to this scattering matrix here and you see these off-diagonal elements uh, that are depending on the relative orientation of VZZ to the polarization basis. And uh, this is again, this, uh, uh, this panel, now you can maybe better understand how this matrix is, uh, is generated and calculated. Um, so this is a sort of, was a short tour actually, how to derive this here and give you a flavor of uh, how this is related to the angle, and this is an important property here, how is this uh, related to the angle uh, of the electric field, um, uh, uh, field gradient tensor. So uh, with this we work now on a study uh, with metal organic complex. That was a collaboration with the group of Volker Schünemann and Kaiserslautern. He, they provided this uh, complex uh, which actually shows a spin crossover transition at uh, about 150, 170 um, uh, uh, Kelvin. Uh, where the system moves from low spin to a high spin state and this leads to significant changes in the uh, electric field gradient um, <coughs> at the iron, uh, uh, at the iron uh, atoms here in this uh, sample. This is a monoclinic uh, uh, structure here. Um, this is the molecular packing. This is the structure here of the molecule. And uh, so <coughs> this uh, spin crossover transition that was uh, actually what we wanted to study with this method and we wanted to actually uh, see and look um, what, um, what can we learn with high purity polarimetry um, 
uh, from this uh, system as a sort of uh, first experiment um, in this direction. Um, so uh, this is a geomet uh, the goniometer. Um, I mean, it's a, a few words on the experimental setup. So this is, this is a crystal. So we work on tiny, we can work on tiny samples. It's, I mean, uh, in principle, it's still macroscopic because here, now it looks large, but it is uh, one millimeter across here. This was uh, is a single crystal grown by Julius Wolny and a group of Volker Schünemann. Um, <coughs> so this is a close-up view here um, <coughs> of this tiny thing here that is a pre-oriented crystal here on this goniometer head. And uh, you do this in your lab with an X-ray tube uh, <coughs> and bring this to the experiment. And um, so and this is the size of the X-ray beam, uh, roughly. So the X-ray beam can be very well collimated and uh, focused onto the sample. And we can, in principle, we could raster scan over the sample to identify the, the sweet spots, or the good uh, uh, parts of it, for example. But this was uh, very uh, perfect th throughout, although the surface does not look so, so nice. Um, and uh, this is uh, eventually the experimental setup at the beam line uh, in Hamburg at Petra 3. So here is this little geometer, uh, goniometer that I have just shown the slide before. This, this piece here is sitting here in the center of a Eulerian cradle, and you can hardly see the crystal anymore. Uh, this is actually uh, here. Uh, uh, the beam is coming actually from here. I should have drawn it here. The, the incident beam is coming from here. here. There is a detector, and here we have a cryostream. We have a cold gas, a stream of cold uh, <coughs> nitrogen gas to, to change the, the temperature of the crystal. Um, and uh, simultaneously, we have high degree, uh, I mean, we have uh, angular degrees of freedom to adjust the uh, uh, angular position of the crystal quite well. The crystal was characterized, pre characterized by Merzbrot spectroscopy, of course, so there's a very pronounced quantum pool interaction. Uh, DFT calculations already give us uh, a hint uh, on the uh, <coughs> uh, electric field gradient tensor here in this sample. And uh, this differs from high spin to low spin. And um, there's, of course, a clear, uh, that is already known from Merzbrot spectroscopy that there is a change of EFG orientation due to the, uh, <coughs> due to the uh, spin crossover uh, transition. So these are data um, <coughs> taken uh, at various orientation. I can only show, um, OK, uh, how many? Are you finished? OK, I'm finished. OK, uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite close to, uh, to, to, to conclude. Um, so these are the select of, uh, selected uh, time spectra uh, recorded here in this setup where we here in this case, uh, rotate the, uh, the chi angle of the sample relative to the beam. That is, so, so we rotate around the photon wave vector, and we get a, a, a characteristic uh, d dependence here of the integrated intensity. So at some crossing at, at 45 degrees, we get here zero transmission, actually. There's no optical activity here. It's very high optical activity. And we can nicely fit the data. Uh, then we do, actually, a variation also of the rotation angle phi. We get a characteristic dependence. And from that, from all these data, um, we uh, get out uh, a field gradient tensor that already matches quite closely what has been calculated by DFT calculations before. And then, of course, we were interested in what happens at low temperatures um, if we uh, cool down uh, below the transition temperature for the spin crossover. Uh, so we get a very pronounced change of these, uh, these curves uh, uh, these transmission curves as function of chi angle, so uh, a very pronounced change of the EHG orientation. And um, this is our <coughs> um, uh, actually uh, what we then uh, use for further investigation. So here at this point, for example, where uh, we have the maximum of the, um, uh, the, the high spin um, uh, signal, we uh, were looking at 120 Kelvin and took a time spectrum to uh, identify the relative content of the high and low spin uh, uh, phases and uh, uh, to uh, give you the final result. Actually, uh, the sample was mostly in a low spin state, but there was still a 22% high spin component that was oriented in the system, not randomly distributed as was suggested before. So this is a, a result that, can I, that I can say is already uh, 
uh, um, uh, an interesting feature of this new method, we really are able to study minority phases uh, uh, of this um, um, of, 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 of low spin or high spin components in in such mixed uh, valence uh, mixed uh, mixed states um, of high and low spin systems. So uh, I, yeah, this is actually a summary of what I have just uh, uh, said before. Perspectives. Uh, from, uh, from this is uh, that we can trace now electronic changes connect, connected to structural and electronic dynamics so we can impulsively excite this high and low spin uh, transition um, <coughs> or the spin crossover systems uh, uh, so uh, by external stimuli and really uh, detect online uh, with very high temporal resolution what happens. Um, so and this is a, a graphical summary of what I said and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.